the Saturday Morning Nerd Show. I'm Mark Blake, your host, and joining with me, as always, is the brewing sailor, Brendan Smith. Good morning, everybody. And, you know, I love the intro to our show because I get a beautiful visual of Bonnie Bedelia punching William Atherton in the face every Saturday morning. <laughs> Hans Nine. Gruber falling off the Nakatomi Towers. Uh, and, you know, that's the great thing about Beethoven's Ode to Joy. You know, it's free use, and we can't get in trouble for it using whatever version and you're right it's also part of the Die Hard soundtrack yes and, it, and you know let's be honest William Atherton getting punched in the face is a reason to have an ode to joy exactly <laughs> exactly and joined with us from the uh, electric jellyfish podcast is Mr. Chad Womack morning gentlemen thanks for having me on all right well it's another exciting morning it's raining here in Texas yet again uh, but we got a lot of fun things to talk about uh first things first real quick if you're a true nerd you've already watched army of the dead on netflix uh it dropped yesterday and we uh I'm very excited about this film it was actually the first time we've gotten to do a press screening inside the theater uh in almost basic well basically here and we got to enjoy that last week uh and of course got to go and see uh a quiet place too uh which finally got released uh this week so we're getting back to being able to do stuff in the movies in the movie theaters and that's just an exciting time because there's just certain movies that are meant to be seen on the big screen and as much as we like screeners to be able to review stuff early sometimes we just want to see it on the big screen like in an imax theater so um also kind of going out and this one is for you gamers out there um if you've never played Mass Effect, but you've always been interested in that, uh, it's a good time to get and play that because of the Mass Effect Legendary Edition, which was released last week. And it is the remastered version of Mass, Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3. And it's beautiful. They've done a great job. Uh, and you can pretty much play the remastered version of those three games and forget about the piece of crap that was Mass Effect Andromeda. Andromeda. <laughs> but we're still reminded of the bad ending of three, so there's still that. Well, I didn't even I, hate the ending of three that much. I think that was a lot of overreaction personally, but hey, whatever. Now Andromeda, no, that was total crap. Like was, I, I like yeah, that was, trash. Yeah. So, I mean, but that's but that's also post doctors. Like that's that's there's two like kind of like A B Y and B B Y in Star Wars. There is a yeah. defining moment in Bioware's uh, development cycle, and that is pre and post Doctors Ray and Greg. Once Doctor Ray Mizuka and Doctor Greg Zuschek left the company, that's when it goes. Mm. You know, um, when I got the PS5, uh, the entire like uh, back catalog of exclusive, not exclusive games, but like the Premium Plus games they always give out for free. You got to get all of them, like all in one bundle. And Mass Effect Andromeda was one of them. I actually started it over just to see if maybe I had been wrong the first time because I never really had uh, played it that much. Nope, that was right. It's still crap. It's still shit. <laughs> yeah. So I really wish I had those uh, three hours back when I started it over. But uh, it's been great, like I said, to go back and. Uh, start over and uh, I've never completed the first Mass Effect game before and you now I'm on my way to do it in a, in a beautiful remastered you know version so it's kind of like uh, Call of Duty we are going to release a new Call of Duty game but we're also going to do the remastered version of Modern Warfare 2 which is generally considered the best Call of Duty game ever and that's going to end up being the best Call of Duty game released last year <laughs> so uh, anyway Good times, good times. Um, so, summer is upon us. We have, you know, we've got summer movie releases that are uh, coming out. And this one I was actually a little excited to hear about. I don't, uh, HBO or Warner Media has kind of reversed its decision on a few films uh, now that movie theaters are opening back up, um, especially like here in Texas where love or hate the governor, they just, basically wrote into law that businesses can't force you to wear a mask anymore if, you, if you've been vaccinated. Um, but, and that includes movie theaters. Anyway, what I was kind of getting at is uh, the movie Dune, 
which was supposed to be released last year and was going to be released in October of this year, uh, it will not be going to HBO Max. It is going straight to theaters, as it should be. And Good. that would be a great night uh, with one of our events that we're planning this year because we have to see that on the big screen. Yeah. I, I think the two movies I'm looking forward to most right now um, going forward this year are Dune and um, uh, Death on the Nile. Yeah. Oh, I thought Death on the Nile got pushed to uh, – I think that got pushed to uh, 2022. Uh, I thought it was November of this year, but I'll double check. Yeah, we'll double check. I know there's been it, it's been back and forth. I, I knew they released they were going to do it later this year, uh, but uh, I, yeah, it, they get pushed from well, not too far back anyway. It got pushed from November to February, so right, February I, 11th. So that's yeah, that's I think cool. A lot of that had to do with Army Hammer's uh, controversy going on right now, so. And if you don't know really what that's about, apparently he texted stuff about BCL <laughs> to some woman, not his wife. So, and, and you're like, so he texted some weird shit to another woman. Now, right? is this like, is this like him? Like, cause I have questions. <laughs> <laughs> is this like, like full on, like, I'm a bestiality weirdo, or did he just make a donkey show Tijuana joke? Because those are two different things. <laughs> I don't you know. know. And, and you can't really trust TMZ to get an accurate picture. But you, I'm like, well, no, you can't. So, so, Marcus, you could have stopped that sentence after you can't trust TMZ, period. <laughs> well, yeah, I, heard it got, I heard it was darker than that. I heard it wasn't about bestiality. I, I had read on several accounts it was about cannibalism. Or maybe maybe there was some cannibalism in it too. But yeah. I'm also like, at the end of the day, a movie star got caught texting weird shit to a woman. <laughs> so in other words, it's a day that ends in Y. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did Brett Brett Favre's got to be going? Whoo! I'm off the hook. I'm not such a <laughs> dick anymore. Yeah. Like, did he actually do any of these things? Is it on video? Then who the fuck cares? Mm. My God. We want to just see the damn movie that he's in. Release it. But uh, I mean, and it's God. an ensemble cast, too. It's like it's not like I'm going to see it because of Army Hammer. I'm going to see it because it's our Gilbaro. Does like, anybody I, go see anything because like, it's Army Hammer, I, for Christ's sake? I, think, I, th I mean, I, I think we're losing fact, sight of the fact that the only author that has outsold Agatha Christie is God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Bible is the only thing that has outsold Agatha Christie. Okay, right. she's gonna survive the Army Hammer apocalypse. <laughs> she's gonna she's gonna survive Hammergate. Right. But I mean, again, I love it, it, and equally parts hate you right now, Chad. <laughs> okay. Now I, this is not I, this week's sign of the apocalypse. Uh, we just wanted to throw it out there that it, I mean, if that's what you're stopping a movie about. Let's just slow your roll here, okay? Come mm. on. Although, Let's... when you get to this week's sign, I have a, a this week's sign 1B because I did just come across something from last night that I went, what? So we'll wait till we get there. There's just a little tease. So we've got two We've got two for you again this week. What? What? More more, more French hemorrhoid cream penis injections? <laughs> no, I don't think anything. That might be a top, like, that might be a contender for apocalypse of the year uh, <laughs> at the end of the decade. year. Shit, the uh, decade just started. But uh, that, that might be a contender for the best one of the year. But no, this isn't quite that good. But we'll... Okay. This is this will probably well, be a one B. We'll see what at, uh, what Marcus has got up here. But all right. So one thing I did want to quickly announce again, this is for you gamers out there. Uh, very excited that uh, this place has finally reopened, and it reopened a couple weeks ago. Uh, the National Video Game Museum, right here in Frisco, Texas. Yes. Uh, so you'll have a chance to go back and see uh, some of the changes that they've made. Because um, I mean, for the first time that we covered it, they've added a lot more. They're, you know, into their uh, video game museum 2.0 uh, with more stuff coming. It got delayed a year, like most things, but they are open. And if you have not been, and it's weird, the, mo and the, mo the more people I talk to that love video games don't even realize this place exists in Frisco. And I'm like, how? How have you not and been it's, there? It's like not too far from uh, FC Dallas, like right. uh, stadium, yeah. Toyota Stadium. 
it's like right, as, you know, about, right as up the, the street. Flies, yeah, a few minutes yeah. away from it. And and it's been here how many years now? What are they in uh, five. Four? Four? Fifth year? Five? Fifth year? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Holy cow. Yeah. Time it flies. was 2016. Yeah, I had to look up the uh, our video from when we covered it. So, yeah. Maybe we um, should maybe we should contact them and go back and do a five year anniversary special. Yeah. No, no that's actually what uh, something I wanted to do this year uh, is go back and see what changes they have done, especially post pandemic. Um, so it is something uh, slated uh, for something that you know we want to do, but. Anyway, also to the email that I got asking if we were going to cover the Friends reunion. No, we are not. Um, and when I say that, the only Friends reunion that we'll ever cover is if the cast of Coupling get back together 20 years later. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll, I'll take the hit on that. I'll take the bullet if, if you want it covered. I'll watch it. I, I was a fan of the show. So you, you, you do what you want, but for the, for this particular podcast and that nerd show, we're not covering it. We don't care enough. <laughs> um, I mean, like I've seen five episodes and I, and I can honestly say that, yes, I love the one where Joey and Chandler get free porn. I mean, that's a funny episode, but I still think the best one is with Brad Pitt, you know, when he loses all the weight and it turns out he's the one that with Ross that started the rumor about Rachel being the her map. Hermaphrodite <laughs> cheerleader. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I was like, yeah, we don't care. You know, I would rather watch Coupling. Also, if you want a quick review on uh, the woman in the window movie that's on Netflix, here's how I describe it Jimmy Stewart is great in this film, but Jimmy Stewart is great in all of his films. And when Grace Kelly walks in and that first scene, and of course, you know, she's just prancing around. And when she's searching, you know, the, the suspect's apartment played by Raymond Burr. Oh, yes, I'm actually reviewing Rear Window, the <laughs> original, <laughs> in case you did not know it. Because that's what this movie is. Somebody asked me, you guys going to cover it? No. We liked it better the first time when it was called Rear Window. And nothing against Amy Adams. I mean, I, I love Amy Adams as an actress, but it's like, you're a woman stuck in an apartment spying on your neighbors. How is this unique? <laughs> You're Mrs. Kravitz from Bewitched, for Christ's sakes. <laughs> right. Uh, but I do want to do one quick little uh, movie review um, that we didn't really write out, but we just wanted to talk about it. Uh, it kind of slipped through the cracks of stuff that was getting released, and it's on HBO Max right now. It got released a couple of weeks ago. Um, if you are a fan of Taylor Sheridan, uh, he is the creator of Yellowstone on uh, the Paramount, NBC. I don't even know who they're on by at this point. I, I just know that all three seasons are on the Peacock streaming service. Um, he wrote the movie Hell or High Water with Chris Pine, Ben Foster, and Jeff Bridges, uh, Wind River. Uh, he started out first couple of seasons of Sons of Anarchy. Uh, but I mean... He has written some incredible movies, you know, high octane, great thrillers, that kind of thing. Um, if you love his filmmaking, then you should check out the Angelina Jolie, John uh, Berthenol uh, film that's on HBO Max called Those Who Wish Me Dead. Uh, it's not, I don't know if it's really his best work, but it's typical what he normally writes. Uh, thriller, engaging, action-packed, um, kind of keeping you on the edge of your seat. And uh, Angelina Jolie did a you know, really good job uh, in this film as you know, a fire watcher that rescues a kid whose parents were murdered. And, uh, and of course, you get Adrian Gillian uh, who uh, plays the bad guy. So, Which, but it, like, I, doesn't I, he I, always? <laughs> <laughs> Has Aiden Gillian ever been the good guy? Like, uh, no, no. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Bohemian oh, Rhapsody. Blue Book. And what? Uh, well, Bohemian Rhapsody, you're right. But oh, also right. Project Blue Book, yeah. which uh, we interviewed uh, the cast. And not him. He was not there, unfortunately. Uh, but we interviewed the rest of the cast uh, when that show started um, on um, the History Channel. And if you don't know what Project Blue Book is, that's the Air Force. Um, that's the Air Force program that started researching UFO sightings um like in the late 50s and 
Amy Gillian plays Professor uh, Hynek, who was a Ohio State professor that it, basically it's like the X-Files, but actually true. And, and uh, researched all this stuff for like 30 years and built a book that got published of uh, findings and sightings and stuff like that. And also he was hired to discredit a lot of things, uh, but really couldn't. So uh, they did two seasons. Uh, again, you can catch the two seasons on the Peacock streaming channel. It's very good. But anyway, I just wanted to say those who wish me dead, um, if, as I said, if you're a fan of Taylor Sheridan, you should definitely check that film out. It's very good. Uh, a lot of fun. And it's a great one to watch on HBO Max um, if you have it. So I don't know if I would pay full price to go see it in the movie theater. I mean, I probably would just because I'm a Taylor Sheridan fan to begin with. And he's never really made a bad movie, you know, in, in my, my mind. But uh, as I said, it's a really good one for HBO Max, and it's and it's not really that long, so it gets quite it gets to the point uh, with what's going on. And you, the best way I can describe it, remember when Backdraft came out, and everybody was just all you know, absolutely in awe. The first movie about you know really getting into fire and how it surrounded everything, and uh, you know, all we were impressed with all the stunt, stunt coordinators who actually walked into fire. I mean, it was impressive when that movie came out. Uh, I feel like Those Who Wish Me Dead is very much in the same vein that you're surrounded by forest fires. I mean, they did an incredible job. Uh, now, I mean, I'm sure they used mostly CGI this time around, but uh, it looks great. And, you know, as I said, it's a pretty good film. It's an easy six or seven out of 10 for me. So go check that out. All right, topic of this today's show before we get to this week's Sound of the Apocalypse is simple. We are going to be talking about the best written show, TV shows between 2010 and 2020 over the course of that decade. And when we say best written TV shows, we're not talking about the most popular TV shows. We are talking about the ones that are the most well written, sometimes underrated shows between network cable or streaming services. Things that we enjoyed that um, may have flown under the radar in popularity, but all of it from beginning to end is fantastic and it's all and great to go back and rewatch. So that's what we're going to be discussing. And if nothing else, we're going to be recommending shows that it might be time to go back and uh, rewatch um, this summer. So, but before we do that, this week's Sound of the Apocalypse. And this goes out to Anthony Ragusa, who is about to go to prison for uh, disabilities fraud in the state of New York. Now, the reason that we're actually talking about this guy is he's a self-proclaimed Arnold Schwarzenegger fan and is even quoted as saying that he would love to be the next Conan. Um, well, the reason he's going to jail is he claimed that he had a disability and got over $200,000 in disability benefits over a number of years. Well, he's a bodybuilder <laughs> and um, not paralyzed. So as you can imagine, yes, it's pretty easy to, you know, catch him in that lie and prove that you're not really disabled as a bodybuilder. Yeah, and Facebook makes investigating so easy sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And that's how he got caught. He was tagged in a photo uh, by his wife, who is a personal trainer, uh, talking about how he was getting in shape and bodybuilding. And, uh, and again, being quoted that he would love to be the next uh, Conan. Um, looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger, who he's, he's, he's a big fan of. Well, Conan he better be a defendant now is what he well, is. I was going to say, he better be a barbarian in prison or else he's going to be on the wrong end of some... Uh... Well, ah, and unfavorable that's, that's circumstances, right. shall we say. When you go to prison and you meet your husband, I'm sure he can call you Conan. <laughs> that could be that could be his pet name for you. We hope you enjoy. <laughs> but, so, I mean, so here's not, all, who, not we'll go only ahead. are you this week's out of the apocalypse, but you also get this week's Darwin Award. <laughs> 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 or at least at least Darwin adjacent. Uh, you didn't right. actually die, but you know, 
You're going to wish uh, you were. <laughs> now, no, if he was getting yet. disability benefits for being paralyzed and then had an aneurysm because he used too much steroids and, you know, <laughs> his ex- brain exploded while he was doing bench press, then, yeah, okay, then he's a full-on Darwin awardee. But he's, right. he's at least a Darwin honorable mention. Um, fast way to suicide your career in life. Uh, yeah, so I also want to point out, too, that if you're going to claim disability benefits to where you can't work or you really are disabled, then you actually need to watch the show Trailer Park Boys, which originally, which came out of Canada. It's a Canadian show. Uh, Netflix has been doing new seasons. But the dad, uh, Ricky's dad, who is claiming disability, you know, fake wheelchair, the whole nine yards watches when he stands up that's how you get away with that so maybe you should have watched that show to learn how to properly do it and not go to the gym be a bodybuilder or you don't go to the gym at all and you do it at home but then again wouldn't you just be Barry Bonds once your muscles became bigger and you were like I never took steroids (laughs) or at least at least skip leg day like because yeah. if you're trying to say that you're a paraplegic, right? You can't like you can't have tree trunk legs. They're gonna atrophy. <laughs> right. Right. You gotta look like the, the, the police dude from you know family guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or Mr. Incredible, you know. Yeah. So like you, you can't look like, a like yeah, I can't walk. Why do your legs look like they're twice the size of an NFL running backs then? <laughs> um like it just it's not working and my wife's over here dying laughing so if it comes through in the audio uh it, we don't we're not using a laugh track she's just laughing at us uh, it's i i just feel like i mean you you deserve to go to prison for stealing disability benefits obviously you mostly deserve to go to prison because you're, you're an idiot right when you so you speaking of stupid uh oh, seems to be a theme. Um, <laughs> this week's sign of the apocalypse one B is <laughs> Chuck the Iceman Liddell is not fighting. He's refereeing. He's refereeing a match. I can't even believe this is going to come out of my mouth. Between Backstreet Boys, Aaron Carter, and Lamar, I've almost died five times, Odom. For the love of God. Wow. Lamar yes. has overdosed so many times and has like died, like literally died and been brought back. What athletic commission okayed him to fight in a boxing match? And the answer is New Jersey. There you go. <laughs> should we just call him, should we just call him Lamar of Nazareth at this point? Yeah, pretty much. I got I got two I got two things to say to that. that. To the New Jersey. Lamazarus. You know, <laughs> uh, whatever cocaine that they freely give you to help you make these great choices, please share. And <laughs> you, if we're just tra- Lamar Odom, if, if if you're just trying to reenact the Apollo Creed death w- for UFC, which I figure that's that's the only lo- logical reason that you're trying. To you got to pick do. somebody with bigger muscles than. Aaron Carter. Aaron Carter. <laughs> There's yeah. not gonna be the, if he dies, he dies. Which, by the way, <laughs> I don't, dude, I don't care if you have a neck tattoo, you were a backstreet boy, and you still have blonde hair with black roots. <laughs> like, I, I don't care how many tattoos you get on your neck and your face. Like, I can spank you. Like, yeah. you're just not <laughs> that tough. No. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and I, like, the only way I'm watching this video is if this, and this is on pay per view, folks. People actually have to pay to see this. I don't know who the hell would. I'm sure somebody will, right. at least common denominator being what it is. But the only way I would watch this, if, if I got a private message from Chuck going, hey, in the third round, Stone Cold Steve Austin is going to come out of the crowd. I'm going to knock out Lamar. He's going to stunner Aaron Carter, and we're going to drink a beer in the middle of the ring. Then I'm watching. <laughs> Artie's like, flying everywhere. Then, and freaking then, then, then I'm paying for that on pay-per-view and hosting a watch party. <laughs> but, <laughs> but just to see these two idiots get destroyed. Just, just but I am not watching these two box. It's good. <laughs> It's going to be like watching a high school fight. Like, who wants to watch this? 
I don't understand this like celebrity. Like I, you know, this is why Jake and Logan Paul need to be taken out and shot because they've yeah. started this freaking stupid celebrity boxing Perfect trend dude, that yeah. I thought died 10 years ago. Anyway, that's all I got. On that. I, I can't believe I can't believe they let Lamar Odom into a ring. The guy has literally died like five times. OK. You talk about like high school fighting and stuff, you know, why are we why are we allowing people to, you know, fight like this? I, I, I get celebrity boxing. OK, it's funny. It's entertaining. You know, I, I, I enjoyed it when um, I, I totally enjoyed it when Tanya Harding did celebrity boxing. Um, why not? Or when Willis, I don't even know the actor's name, from Different Strokes got in there. That's fine. But I don't think any of them, you know, actually, I, I just don't, I mean, you never thought any of them would die. But yeah, like Lamar could yeah. like Lamar takes now, granted, I don't actually believe that Aaron Carter can throw a punch strong enough. No. But you never know. Like you get the one good shot in the temple, you know. I mean, let's face it, Lamar's liver can't be up to a good liver shot. Like, there's no way. I, I'm thinking Lamar might die just on the march down to the ring. <laughs> yeah, you never know. Just the adrenaline <laughs> kicks in, yeah. Kill over, you know, that's all it takes. All right. I, I'm gonna share a quick video. This is exactly how I think the fight is what I think the fight is really going to be. So oh no. I feel like we need a drum roll. <laughs> Come on, screen. What? Or the girl from Ipanema should kick in or something. <laughs> oh, while we're waiting for this, uh, Marcus, did you hear that? Did you hear that Henry Cable is going to play uh, Connor McLeod? I was going to bring this up. So, well, yeah, maybe, maybe. Anna, Anna, that Star Wars girl, is kind of funny because she apparently um, really, really likes Henry Cavill. So she was gushing a little too much about about. Uh, Henry Cable playing Connor McLeod. She's like, my uterus is doing cartwheels. Holy shit. <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm more excited about. The, the fact that they're going to bring that back or the fact that who oh, they've got directing this thing. Yeah. That got my attention. Yeah. I, uh, so well, here's, I, I, I do oh, apologize ahead, if Zoom is not working correctly today and we're trying to share a video, but I figure uh, that the, the, the fight uh, between these two idiots is really going to be the fish lapping dance from Monty Python. That's what I was trying to do. <laughs> Probably, yeah. That's what it's going to look like. <laughs> so I'll have to cut that in post to get my point across. So, but anyway, quick, yeah, back to uh, the reboot of uh, the High, uh, Highlander. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's been rumored for quite a while that uh, they're, you know, they're going to do this and different people attached to it. I think Henry Cavill is, uh, you know, Cavill is perfect for this. Let's get it done. Yes, but. I'm kind of like our friend Devin Pike who posted on social media today. Uh, until we see production until we still. we see production still, still yeah. <laughs> well, here's the, right movie. there with you. Here's the thing, though. Um, so this is, uh, uh, unlike, you know, Ryan Reynolds being attached to it a few years ago, what, that was all rumored. This is Cable himself coming out and talking about it, which I, I think is, makes it a little different. The other thing, too, is so Cable's going to be Connor McCloud. Who y'all got for Ramirez? Yeah. Who, who, who are you thinking? Because I've got somebody in mind, and I think it's going to be perfect. Because remember, when the original came out, uh, Chris, uh, Christopher Lambert was in his 30s, and Connery was in his mid-50s. So keep that. Because, yes, I know immortals don't have to look older, but I think having Ramirez look a little bit older helped that master-apprentice yeah. dynamic be accepted by the audience. Mm-hmm. Um, so who do, you guys, who do you guys think for Ramirez? And I'll give you mine after that um honestly i don't know i don't really that's a good one i still can i'm pretty much just picturing sean connery so chad do we actually are we actually going to get a spaniard this time (laughs) rather than some (laughs) rather than a scotsman posing as a spaniard Uh, i know a a scotsman posing as an egyptian posing as a spaniard (laughs) 
Because <laughs> remember, he he was uh, Ramirez was originally Egyptian named Takne. Yeah, that's true. Uh, um, uh, honestly, uh, the, really, the first person that that jumped to mind uh, would be the guy that played his dad in Man of Steel. Uh, Russell, Russell Crowe. Crow? Yeah, I think I got one better for you though. Mm-hmm. And yes, he is Spanish. Javier Bardem. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Oh. It, I think it, Javier Bardem would be amazing as Ramirez or and or Antonio Banderas. Uh, yes, I, but Banderas is if I don't know if you've seen him lately, he would have to do a lot to get into shape to do a sword fighting movie because so he would Russell has Crow. <laughs> uh, well, if, from a different perspective, Russell Crowe would have to cut weight. Uh, Bar, uh, Banderas would have to bulk up because Banderas is in his 60s now and he's extremely thin compared to what he used to be. Um, he's probably yeah. lost 30 pounds of muscle mass mm. um, from his days. And like, he, yeah, knows, he knows his way around the blade. He does. Um, Bardem is still a physically bigger, more, uh, I think, has more vitality in that sense. And he's also a little younger. Bardem, I believe, is 51 or 52, um, where Banderas is a full decade older. So uh, I, don't, I don't think it would be bad, and I don't think Banderas can't do it. I just think I think Bardem would be just awesome. I think he's flashing up to it. He's still one of my all time favorite James Bond villains. He was so good in Skyfall. Oh yeah. He he's fantastic. And I, I just think he's a great actor and I think he would be a, a perfect Ramirez, but that's yeah, just my like opinion. My favorite, so. my, my, my favorite exchange in, uh, you know, Skyfall is when he's just kind of uh, touching James Bond and, is this your first time? And James Bond quickly, what makes you think this is my first time? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? You know what, though? The real question for me, this is what my wife and I were talking about last night whenever this topic came up. Uh, yeah, I mean, because let's be real. Nobody went to go see Highlander because they were a Christopher Lambert fan. No, no. no. It's not like this thing is a is a sacred, you know, you know oh, my God, somebody other than Christopher. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think anyone cares. The big question for me, who's Kurgan? Uh, how about the mountain? The first person that came uh, to my mind, and I threw this at her, was Batista. Eh. No, I don't think uh, Batista would do it. Um, and the problem, and the guy that, and I forget his name, uh, the mountain, uh, he's also lost 110 pounds because he's becoming a boxer. So he's not like as menacing. Well, he's, uh, well, I mean, he's still pretty menacing. He's still, instead of 430 pounds, he's still, he's 330 pounds. Right. But I mean, How, but however, I mean, the guy, um, Rory, uh, Rory Cochran, who played the hound. The hound. That's what I was about to say. I, I could see that. I could see him doing. It. Yeah. 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 That the, would work. The only, problem, the only problem that I, that if he did it is anytime, anytime that he was answering, you know, McLeod, all I would hear in my mind is, Yark? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how serious I can take. Damn it. I was, scary, I, was, man. I was thinking all I'd hear is, cunt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. All right. On That's that note. Going on in your universe. We're going to jump to our topic for the next uh, 45 minutes and talk about some bar of, of the best written shows. And oh, since yeah. we're, we're talking about the hound, uh, I do want to bring up, uh, we. it is the 10th anniversary of the release of Game of Thrones that came out in April of 2011, the very first season. I think we can all agree that Game of Thrones, at least through the first five seasons, uh, even six, incredible. Yeah. I get, I get the complaints of the last two seasons. I get rushing it and stuff and trying to wrap everything up quickly. I mean, there's great episodes. Um, you know, the Battle of Winterfell is still my favorite episode of the last season. But everything leading up to that point, when all of these characters are still on their individual journeys before they meet up with one another, uh, you just have, so, you know, when you're actually still following the original source material before they really have to start inventing or going based off the notes um, because the books aren't done. But I, I will say at least... For me, the first six seasons are, are incredible, um, deserving of awards and, you know, really being able to adapt that 
um, to me is right up there with Peter Jackson being able to adapt the Lord of the Rings novels uh, for movies. Um, and I, in so many ways, I think they perfectly cast uh, the characters. Um, you know, like I know Amelia Clark wasn't the first choice uh, for Daenerys. Uh, she, you, you know, the, the original actress was replaced. But I mean, uh, Peter, uh, you know, Dirklidge and um, it just for Tyrion, you, you really, you have this incredible, incredible cast. So that's my first pick for one of the best friend shows. And even though it was popular, I think it, I think it demonstrated the going off the original source material, just when you are writing the hero's path for various characters up to the point where they will all come together. You're doing all of these origin stories and how they're connected and stuff. That's the most brilliant part of Game of Thrones, not the ending when they're all finally together for the final battles. So kind of like Fellowship of the Ring, it's the yeah. best one out of the trilogy. Or The Matrix is the best one out of the Matrix trilogy. Yeah. So, uh, but that's what I throw out there. Uh, and I know a lot of people, you know, they keep throwing out there, go watch your favorite episodes. Go do this and that. What I find interesting is even HBO, when they're throwing out like the best episodes of Game of Thrones for the 10th anniversary, none of them are in the last two seasons. Of course not. Um, yeah. So anyway, uh, Chad, I'm going to start with you. Uh, one of the best written shows uh, from 2010 to 2020. You have well, what, what sucks is that you just took the one I had for, in that slot, you bastard. Uh, so um, I'll go with my with my next choice, which I'm sure is probably going to shock the both of you, is I was really impressed with The Crown. I've been incredibly impressed with The Crown consistently. You know what? That's another one that I can, I, I praise the casting. Uh, yes. And being able to cast the queen at different eras and um, so, I mean, Matt Smith, I, that's, a th that's the thing like about Matt Smith. We always look at him as being the doctor. Mm -hmm. We don't really recognize him being this great I mean, you don't look at him as Skynet? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Screw that. No. <laughs> we choose, we choose uh, to discuss that. Yeah. But I mean, he has really done a uh, a lot of great things, um, which he'll actually be in the next Game of Thrones series. But if you don't, but if you want a departure about how good Matt Smith can be, even beyond the crown, he did a movie a few years ago with uh, the the actress that played um, the Wildling girl, Sam's girlfriend. Um, oh, Rose. Uh, Rose, what's her name? Uh, no, not Rose. Um, the, the actress oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I know. But anyway, he, he, uh, Matt Smith played a movie called Charlie Says, where he plays Charlie Manson. And it's about the three girls that went to prison that fell under his spell and served their, a life oh, sentence good. as a psychologist is interviewing them. Uh, but you get moments of Matt Smith as Charlie Manson. And I was like, <laughs> wow, I had no idea. Yeah really is an incredible actor. So I, I will give you I will give you that. And I love Olivia Coleman playing the older queen. Um, yeah, that to me that's the most impressive aspect of that show, other than the writing, is that not only did they cast it brilliantly, but they consistently brilliantly recast it. That yeah you know, that you can you can watch these watch these characters that are real life people that you know everybody's intimately familiar with whether they want to be or not. And you buy it. You you completely buy it. It's like it's like there's there's not a hiccup in it whenever they when you see somebody else playing the role that you just saw playing it from the previous season. I'm like, damn, that's that's some good shit. That's it's yeah. consistent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, take Vanessa Kirby who plays uh, Princess Margaret in the first two seasons, and then you get Helen Bonham Carter who plays the older Princess Margaret. You know, you really look at them and like that. Really, it could be the same person. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the actress that plays Princess Diana, uh, Emily, Emma Corbin. Oh, my God. Where would, did you find her that, to me, her level of acting playing Diana is right up there with Rami Malek, you know, basically 
step-by-step word-for-word copying pretty mercury mm-hmm. so, I, so i will get i will definitely give it to you that even if you're not a fan of watching anything about the the crown or the royals of england or whatever and and, and i get it but i will say this oh there goes brandon's hand I, 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 this so i was just saying me i didn't <laughs> yeah. watch it so i can't speak no, no i know but Brendan, this is to you because you and I will pretty much agree on this. This is the only compliment I will ever throw Margaret Thatcher's way. And it has nothing to do with Margaret Thatcher because she's still a con. <laughs> um, but Jillian Anderson as my, Margaret my, Thatcher. My God, that was a revelation to me. That was fantastic. I, I'm like, I will want to write Jillian Anderson a letter and said, God damn it, as an Irish man, you actually made me feel somewhat sympathetic to Margaret Thatcher. You know how much I need that? That's good acting. That's yeah. good acting right there. When you can out-act Meryl Streep in a role that she kind of, you know, claimed as her own, I think Gillian Anderson ran circles around her, to be quite honest with you. I, I agree. I agree. So, yeah, I will give you that uh, when it comes to one of the best written shows uh, that's out there and I think a little underrated. Although, I, I mean, I hear, I have found more and more people that have gotten into watching that on Netflix, which I yeah. think just proves that Netflix, you know, uh, with their original shows, so they kind of choose wisely. So, Brendan, how about you? I'm going with the Americans. I was going to say that next, but we must well jump on that. <laughs> We're just cannibalizing each other's list. Um, and, and the Americans is, so for me, the Americans shows what a poor decision Amazon made by trying to update Tom Clancy's works. Um, because they could have literally just given Tom Clancy's work. And, and look, if, if you're patient enough, Tom Clancy's, the Ryan verse gets into the modern era. Okay. Right. So if you're just patient enough to go through you know, and do the, the Ryan books in chronological order, you know, so I think it actually starts with Cardinal of the Kremlin, then goes to Hunt for Red October, even though Hunt for Red October came out first. And then, you know, hit Patriot Games and Clear and Present minute, time Danger. Out. Time out. Are you, act- wait a minute, you're saying Colonel of the Kremlin, the story is I think actually- chrono- Yeah, I think chronologically it's before. I'll have to no, look up the Ryan. Because, Ra- because there's the scene in the book where Jack Ryan is talking to Ramius who's helping out on tearing apart the Hunt for Red October. Well, one it's, of the books that comes after or comes out after. Yeah, it's directly after. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to find the chronological order. Uh, chronology. Well, no, no. Patriot Games was published uh, next. So, okay. Was, so Patriot was, Games actually. So let's see. So that's Patriot cool. Games is an 81. Red Rabbits in 82. Hunt for Red October is 84. Cardinal of the Kremlin is 86. Claire and Present yeah. Danger is 88. Some of All Fears is 90 to 91. Dead of Honor is 95 to 96. Executive Orders is 97 to 98. Rainbow Six is 99 to 01. Bear and the Dragon takes place in 2002. Teeth of the Tiger takes place in 2006. And then I pretty much stopped counting after that because those were all shadow written. Well, Dead or Alive, I think, still had Tom Clancy's involvement. But I think after yeah. that, they all pretty much get shadow written. Um but anyway, but I mean, if you just did those books as one story, if you just if you just did those books as one season, kind of like how Bosch is filmed, um, you know, or Game of Thrones, for example, and you just did right. it as a period piece. I, I think Jack Ryan and, you know, now the, the Without Remorse movie would have been so much better. And it would have been so because, look, I get it. Like you're trying to make it accessible for everybody because that's what big studios do. But we've already shown that these movies can make a lot of money when they came out. Number one, number two, the, the Americans have shown that period spy thrillers do really well. Uh, So did Tinker Taylor soldier spy, Um, you know, so sometimes if it ain't broke, don't fix it studios. You don't have to make everything bright, shiny and new. Just do what you're supposed to. And I love the Americans for, being a period piece in a time where everybody's trying to make update shit for the we've got to update it for the new audience no if it's good it's good Mm -hmm. like you don't have to update it for a new audience and i love that about the americans i love the fact that said no we're an 80s spy thriller and i think that's fantastic and And it was really well written it was really well written the dialogue between the husband and wife who were the embedded kgb spies between their handler who looked like she was you know by the way, the handler was also uh, one of the villains in Justified. 
Sean. Yeah, Marga right Martindale. Yeah, Marga yeah. Martindale, who was born uh, in East Texas, although she's lived in New York for the past few years. But yeah, yeah she's an East her. Texas girl, uh, went to Lon Morris uh, Junior College in Jacksonville. Uh, yeah, and she thinks, you know, problem. she looks like she looks like, you know, like she runs a little mom and pop store and then she's a KGB agent, a KGB handler. And then, you know, you've got the the interactions between the spies and the FBI agent that they live next door to. I mean, it's it, it, I love how that show is written from multiple angles and you have all these different right. interconnections and it's just extremely well written. And it. Whenever I watch Jack Ryan or Without Remorse and it pisses me off, I just go watch an episode of The Americans to make me feel better. <laughs> yeah. I like the first season of the Jack Ryan. I mean, it was, you know, really good. They, you know, it's like this can work in the modern era, but they just kind of screwed everything up with trying to redo a version of Clear and Present Danger for the second season. And again, you keep trying to make Jack Ryan some kind of field agent and he's not. And it's so I get it that it's not as sexy, but you know, there's a lot more to the Americans than them actually using their fighting skills. It's 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 a slow burn into stuff. Like, I mean, you get to that third season when you figure out or you start to realize that Paige is not stupid. Their daughter knows that something is up and then they finally have to admit who they are. Um, and she starts kind of falling in line with that next program, which is actually very true of what the Russians did. Um, but two things that are really great about that show too, is the guy who created it, who really was from the CIA had to get all of his scripts approved for anything he wanted to use from his time of, you know, covering res Russian espionage. Well, after, uh, yeah. And that, that's actually kind of funny because it, it kind of coincides with what happened to Clancy too, because after, um, after the uh, U.S. Naval Institute, who was the original publisher of The Hunt for Red October, because Clancy couldn't get it published by anybody, um, uh, when they published it, the, the Department of Defense freaking basically sent investigators to Clancy and interviewed him for hours about who his sources were. And he was like, uh, Jane's fighting ships. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, he's Pretty like, all of my sources are, are you know, public, public, public information. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. Reagan's own Reagan's own national security advisor cornered him at like some kind of function. It was like, how did you even fucking get access to this? And he's like, I went to the library. Yeah. <laughs> I right. so Which, by the way, making that comment is basically the same thing. Premise of the main character for three days of the condor. Which, by I the way, books. yeah. Which, by the way, was why uh, so when I said the U.S. Naval Institute um, the, the published it. They, they publish a monthly magazine, which I, I've been a member of the Naval Institute for a long time. You, you get, uh, it's called Proceedings. Um, so, which is why the way when they're doing the opening credits of the, the Hunt for Red October uh, with Alec Baldwin, um, he's throwing stuff into his suitcase, getting prepared to go from London to, to Langley. And there's a copy of that month's issue of Proceedings in his, in his uh, suitcase. Yeah. Good so, eye for detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but anyway, uh, but yeah, that's, but I know we're getting off topic, but that's, that's why I love the Americans. It was extremely well-written. It's, it's a classic spy thriller and you're right. It is a slow burn. It's, it's, it's not everything, like everything leads up to action, but then the action is quick, violent, and they move back on to story building. And, yeah. you know, it's, it, it's not, it's not the focus of the show. It's a tool to drive the show. Um, and, but the main, the main part of the show is the writing. It is the relationships. It is the dialogue. It is the tension that that dialogue sets up. It's so. also the questioning of, you know, why they're doing this. I mean, cause that's what the husband is going through. Mm -hmm. who basically got drafted into this. He's not all about the cause. Yeah. Like he's not a true believer. believer. Right. Um, but I'll, I'll bring up two quick little points. Uh, the brilliance of the writing, and I think people tend to forget this, when Reagan was shot in the early 80s, you, the, uh, the intelligence community was like, especially spies embedded, what the fuck is going on? Is this the beginning, the first step into an actual war and all that attack? And that's what they're dealing with, having to go through their sources. Did, did it start? Did, is this the signal? And then you're dealing with this paranoia for 24 hours when you realize, no, it's just a crazy kook. Yeah, you know, just a Jody Foster. Enough, it's just a right, dude who J Jody Foster told him to do it, mm -hmm. right? You know, um, but I also love the fact 
to that, you know, like especially in that first episode, you appreciate the FBI agent who is suspicious and his suspicions are right. And he's checking their car and literally right there in the shadows, <laughs> you know, is the husband with a silencer on a pistol ready to blow his brains out. I, I just, I, I very much, I went back and watched the last two episodes because I feel like it should be a two-parter about, you know, when they're finally caught or given up and, you know, all these suspicions are come to head nearly a decade later and you know when they're they're finally done and they're recalled home and what do you do you have to leave your son behind who doesn't know that who they are and how do you get out of the country and facing it but really if, if you want just the level of suspicion they throw into the writing that is very true is when they tell him I don't know. You might want to check on your new wife. Uh, she could be one of us that we don't know. That's what the Russians do. And just putting that in his head, that possibility. So, but yeah, you're right. I mean, it's anybody that loves espionage thrillers, okay, uh, that you don't mind the slow burn and, 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 and can look at the relationships and how they develop and see it from all angles, go, go watch it. And one more thing. I would love to interview Margot Martindale for a number of reasons because I think she's such a great actress. If nothing else to tell her, if she ever shows up at my doorstep dressed as an old lady wanting to use the phone, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. trust. I've seen how this works. <laughs> and I do love that scene where she tases the guy and basically catches him off guard. So anyway. All right. Uh, another great show. It, we've talked about person of interest numerous times on podcasts. And I'm just going to briefly mention one of our all time favorite shows. Really great to go back and watch. Um, if you're wondering where it's at now, not on Netflix, like you were going to binge watch it or you were and got cut off. It's on HBO Max. I feel, I feel like that's a show that, that once kind of surprised that's not on Paramount Plus. I don't know why. It's weird how things end up. Like yeah. the West Wing is on HBO Max. And I'm like, why is that not on Peacock? Yeah. Or yeah. the First Principal there. First but, Principal there. I was going to mention that one too. Yeah. That, that still doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Um, especially when you're dealing with a world with AIs and thinking machines. Uh, no, I can, I can explain that if the production company was Warner and not CBS studios in the case of POI or NBC in the case of uh, Beverly Hill, uh, Fresh Prince of Beverly Hills, then um, it would be on HBO max, not those. So you have to yeah. production because sometimes you have a production company, that's one company and then it, it airs right. on another network, but yeah. So that could be the uh, issue. Well, anyway, that um, uh, still one of our favorite shows. Go go back and watch it if you've never checked it out. I've got I, like Brendan. I've introduced so many people to that show. Uh, I but the funniest thing about in talking about that show is we were talking about it on a podcast years ago, and Allison had to make the comment. Did they have to make Shaw and Root kiss on screen and Brendan just sign with his? Yes. Yes, they did. <laughs> One of the best parts of person of interest. So, all right. But I, I just wanted to quickly mention it. It is one of the best written shows because we've talked about it on numerous occasions. I'm going to bring one up that I actually started watching again because it popped up as a recommendation. Fringe. They had the first three and a half seasons anyway. You know what? It jumped the shark a little bit. But Look, I, I get it. They were just trying to get to 100 episodes so they could go into syndication. I get it. Um, yeah. But the first three seasons in particular are fantastic. I love yeah. Fringe. Uh, Aaron and I go back and rewatch it every so often. And that's 
if you are an X Files fan, you're looking for something similar to that. Fringe is your show. I mean, uh, how awesome of an actor is John Noble? Oh shit! I mean, he's literally playing Yin and Yang of himself because he's playing, you know, the main universe's. Uh, what was his character's name now? I can't even remember, but uh, Joshua Jackson's dad, um, Dr. Walter, Walter, Walter was his name. Yeah. So um, he's playing that wa- version of Walter, which is almost childlike because he's had pieces of his brain removed and, you know, sitting there has, you know, he's got a cow he milks in the side of his own laboratory um, so he can make strawberry milkshakes. He's constantly eating Twizzlers. He never calls Astrid by her name. He either calls her Astro or Asterisk or, you know, whatever. And then you've got the other universe's version of Walter who's buttoned up, who's very serious, who's the de- uh, the Secretary of Defense. You know, it's just like he's playing the same guy, but two completely different versions of him. And he just does it so well. And, I mean, the guy is awesome. Like, we need more John Noble in our lives. <laughs> well, also, if, if, if you've never watched this show, it's actually the last TV series that Leonard Nimoy appeared in. Mm-hmm. So, oh, wow. I forgot about that. And it was great scene, great scenes between, you know, Nimoy and John Noble, too. They, I mean, just two great yeah. actors going back and forth on each other. And, it well, was... and, and I hear people always discuss, like, well, but it's done by J.J. Abrams and some things. Like, well, first of all, J.J. Abrams hasn't done a bad TV show. He's just done stuff that's not as good. Like, for example, if you didn't finish Lost or it was getting too crazy for you, well, if you want to deal with, you know, other realities and fringe science, then go watch Fringe because it is better written than Lost in a lot of ways. Well, and Um, let's be honest, too, the writer's strike killed Lost. Like two two shows that were absolutely destroyed by the writer strike was Lost and Heroes. Yes. Yeah. Damn it, that still makes me mad. Yeah, I know. You had all this great potential, and then your writer strike kills it. Uh, but as I said, I mean, I I feel like every so often uh, we need a show kind of like the X Files, and not necessarily them trying to reboot the X Files. I mean, I'm I'm glad they kind of did. It was nostalgic and kind of cool. We need a spiritual successor, not a direct reboot or sequel. Right. But I mean, like the last season 11 of the X-Files, all you did was spend an entire season retconning, you know, Scully's pregnancy, who yeah. she gives birth to, who really did it. You, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm going to spoil this, but you build all this up only to find out. Oh, of course it was the smoking man who is somehow still alive after all of this. Fuck. I won't yeah. ever know because I love William B. Davis as an actor. However, really, I implanted an alien baby hybrid, blah, 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 who has superpowers. Oh, and then by the end of the episode, somehow at 57 or whatever her age is, you know, she's pregnant again. So her and mother are really going to have a baby together again. And then, yeah, okay. so, but actually, you know what, I, you know, what's kind of the spiritual successor to the X-Files right now is Debris. I don't know if you've been watching that at all. But. No, it's, I keep seeing, I just haven't had a chance to sit down and watch it um, personally. It's, I think it's interesting but, because it's, uh, the, the premise of it is um, an alien spaceship broke up in the soul system and pieces of the spaceship have been landing all over Earth. And all the governments of earth are racing to get as much of it as they can because the tech is so far out of this world. Uh, right. Literally no unintended. Yeah. But uh, the, uh, you know, so you've got like the, the, the U S and the UK working together. The Russians are trying to get stuff The the Chinese are trying to get stuff. And um, it, there's also a, a, a real mystery component because all these pieces appear to be linked and there's all types of things that these different pieces of the spaceship can do. And, it's pretty crazy. So it's uh, it's a good mystery. There's a lot of political machinations going on. It's it's more it, it's there's some action, but it's less about the action and more about the mystery and the intrigue. It's pretty right. good. Um, and that's and we apologize for audience. It's one of those shows that uh, you know kind of is getting. I don't want to say fall into the cracks, but we're waiting till the end to really uh, of this first season to kind of take over you know, a, a review of it. So far, I'll just say it's above average for a network television show. Yeah. 
I will get to a network television show that we are thoroughly enjoying um, here in a minute. Uh, I think Allison and I are the only ones that really watch it, but I'll talk about it here in a minute because most of what we have come across over the last 10 years has really been cable channels and streaming shows. But Chad, oh, bring it about, or bring, I'm going to ask you, tell me another show that, that you feel like has been one of the best written shows in the last decade. Well, <laughs> It ain't going to be a network show. It's going to be a, a cable or, or on a streaming platform. And it was only one season. I guess it's, it was just technically a miniseries. Um, and it was, it came out a couple of years ago. I actually watched, <laughs> I watched a, a good chunk of it on my honeymoon uh, was HBO's Chernobyl. Yeah. Um, I've never been more horrified watching a television series based on an actual event than when I when I was watching Chernobyl. That scared the shit out of me. I mean, uh, it, it, I, like I needed to take a shower after every episode. I was I was that I, paranoid. Getting back to our theme of talking about how you can you know take a book or a story and break it up over multiple episodes uh, instead of trying to cram it into a two hour movie. We're starting to see more and more limited series between Netflix and, and cable streaming channels. Um, HBO Max uh, has been doing it uh, a little while um, between Chernobyl. Uh, they have the Mayor of East Town that's going on right now, which is really good. Uh, but Netflix is seeming is, is turning out to be the king of these. Yeah, like they're just we're doing one and done. They've got one with um, Ewan McGregor now, uh, cautionary tale about a fashion designer. Uh, which just, just watching that, just watched it last yeah, night. No, I mean, we're not really covering it. We we're, we know about it because it's you and McGregor. Unfortunately, <coughs> for that show and our coverage, we're only really interested in one limited series that he's going to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> we won't talk about that right now. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, everybody. But like, unbelievable. Uh, about the uh, serial rapist or whatever was another great one, great investigation about, uh, which is based on a true story about how they couldn't find this guy uh, because he didn't stay in one place when he committed crimes and you didn't have police departments talk to each other, you know, um, with uh, Tony Collette and uh, Dale Dickey, who's, you know, from Texas and one of the jurors at uh, the USA Film Festival, and she's been around for a while. Uh, but there just seems to be more and more of this stuff just popping up. It's like it's one and done, and there you go. We've told it in as, as best as we can. Um, so, uh, all right. I want to bring up a network TV show that we have thoroughly enjoyed uh, the past three seasons. And really, the only reason we checked it out is because Nathan Fillion was in it. And we check out anything with Nathan Fillion because he's, well, Fillion. Uh, the Rookie. Uh, which has turned out to be a, a kind of a surprise hit on ABC. And the premise of it is Nathan Fillion gets a divorce, you know, former contractor living in Pennsylvania and decides to reinvent his oh, life. And Move just to, life. just to clarify for our audience, when we say former contractor, we mean general contractor building houses. We don't mean assassin. Okay. Because it's our audience, you know? So that's like, that's like the other night I'm, I'm scrolling through Facebook and the new England sports networks goes, it's all tied up after three. Now I'm thinking they're talking about the capitals Bruins games going, Holy shit, a fourth straight overtime game. And somebody goes, yeah, you might want to clarify and say, you're talking about the Red Sox game. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Good tip. But anyway, yeah, he reinvents himself, moves to L.A., joins the police academy as a 40-year-old rookie, hence the name, and is going through his first probationary year, which they basically extended over three seasons, uh, tr trying to learn to be a good cop. You know, he's got his classmates, money he's sleeping with. And um, it, it, it's – you get, you know, your cop procedural show – to a point of solving different crimes, but mostly you're dealing with, you know, what LA police officers have to deal with on a daily basis. Are you the hardcore cop uh, that sees danger in every corner versus kind of naive and you want to believe everybody's nice? Uh, Richard, is it Richard T. Jones that plays the sergeant? I believe that's the actor's name. He's literally been around for like 30 years. Um, but 
I'm not saying it's his best show. I still love Castle. The writer in me just loves Castle, at least the first five seasons or six or whatever before it started going off the rails. But The Rookie is turning out to be one of those um, only network shows that we really kind of check out. There's just a lot that we really don't. I'll be honest. I didn't like the first season and I, I didn't really watch the second season because of it, but I'm enjoying the third season. I went back and started watching the third season and I yeah. really enjoyed the third season. So, no, I think it's gotten better as they have got into more complicated, uh, you know, issues. Uh, I love the fact that, I mean, this past season they had uh, Brandon Routh on there who, Extremely nice guy. You can't believe he's going to be a bad guy in anything. Turns out to be a racist cop, you know. And how do you get rid of a racist cop when they can appeal and he's got seniority? And uh, the way that they got him by showing the video of what he did so that no other officer will ride with him or trust him, uh, basically forcing him out, you know, was brilliant. But, um, yeah, like I said, I mean, it's turned out to be one of the better shows that's out there on network TV because frankly there's just a lot that I mean I still watch Blue Bloods and that's literally been around since 2010 but Blue Bloods is pretty much like a Law and Order episode you get your basic procedural and whatever you you but watch even it. that they've turned it on the head I think even Dick Wolf's been going ooh serialized content's a big thing because now they've got they brought Stabler back and they've got Law and Order oh, criminal yeah. intent and it's it's yeah. one story that goes throughout. It's them trying to, or not criminal intent, law and order. That was the old one with D'Onofrio. This is a law and order organized crime, and it's one, yeah. one each season is one story where he's trying to take down one mo- like crime boss. Yeah. So. Yeah, and that's turned out to be uh, pretty good. I mean, I mm-hmm. think when you do a show like, you know, we've talked about it. Then once you get kind of get past five seasons, you start to jump the shark. I'm Unless you can do the, you know, crime of the week. I mean, Law and Order proved that you can do 20 years and still have interesting content. But to keep people going, I mean, people still watch Blue Bloods, but again, you're watching it because of Tom Selleck and he's great. And you, as much as we love him as in Magnum PI, you also want somebody like him as your police commissioner. Get the two different kinds of cops between Danny and, you know, Jamie and, uh, and, and, everything that you have to deal with but it's not one that i would watch like every week like i could miss five episodes and binge, binge, binge watch on a sunday and be like oh okay great yeah it's a good uh, rainy day show yeah um but i mean compared to like well written that you've enjoyed i just that's the thing with network tv you just can't do as much as you can with other stuff so we'll bring it back around to one of our all-time favorite shows, and that's Bosch on Amazon. So, I, new I will season share, coming out in July. I know. I'll share the story and admit that I was highly wrong. That Brendan Smith was absolutely right. It took about three years before I finally started watching it. After Brendan kept, no, no, you got to watch it. You got to watch it. But oh, we got other things we got to review. All right. And I finally sat down. All right, fuck it. And I zipped through like fuck. <laughs> Like four seasons in a week. And Chad, and- have you ever watched Bosch? No, I haven't. Oh, dude. Uh, so season seven comes out uh, on Amazon Prime, I think in July. Um, yeah. I'll check that here in a sec. Uh, but it is extremely worthy. It is based on a series of crime novels uh, by Michael Patterson of the same name. Uh, Titus Welliver plays the titular character, Hieronymus or Harry Bosch, uh, who's an LAPD uh, homicide detective. And it's just like basically the entire season is one or two, one or two cases that multiple teams of detectives will be working on. And they usually kind of intertwine somehow throughout the season. Um, And it's just really, really good. And uh, it's, uh, it's just fantastic television. If you're in a show hole, it's a good way to fill it for with six seasons of like, I think they're about 10 to 12 episodes per season. Yeah. It's um, like 10 to 15 seconds. Yeah. And then, uh, so it's on, it's on prime and it's just, if you're in the middle of a show hole, it's a great way to fill it right now. Cause the new season, like I said, it's coming out, I think July. And it will be the, and it's also the last season. Now they're going to do a spinoff, um, with the lawyer that he hates, but then ends up using it likes. And- yeah. 
stuff like that. Uh, but, June 25th is the release date for the seventh and final season. Yeah. Um, it kind of brings us back around to what we've always talked about with Amazon, that their exclusive shows have been incredibly well written and worth watching. And unlike Even- Netflix, they give them more than two seasons. <laughs> oh, I know, right? Um, like my favorite show by far on Amazon has been The Man in the High Castle. Uh, what they have done with that, great. But you know what? Here's one thing that Amazon, you know, gets right. You know, they always shoot a pilot and usually release the pilot and look at the audience's, you know, comments on it. How how are they viewing the pilot? to determine whether they should continue filming or do an entire season. Sometimes they'll do one season uh, like that Utopia, but the, but Amazon's version of Utopia was just a remake of the British version anyway. Um, but yeah, let the audience decide whether you should you know, continue to make that show. Anyway, um, Brendan, what's another one for you? Oh, let's see. We've talked Bosch. We've talked... You just talked Man in the High Castle. Um, you know, I'm going to take a little different route just because, um, and it it's a little bit more than the past 10 years. It's going back the past 20 plus years, but it's also in our days of wokeness and politically correctness. It's the comedy we need, South Park. <laughs> <laughs> Because they will make fun of everyone and everything, including their own cast members, when they yeah. get too serious about themselves. Isaac Hayes, mm-hmm. I'm talking about you in Scientology. Um, you I know. know. Oh, hey, hey don't, it was okay for Isaac Hayes to make fun of everything, but as soon as South Park made fun of Scientology, well, that was a, a bridge That's too far for him. Line. Yeah, I was, I was like, they were I'll like, all right, get the fuck out of here. You know, a great satirical show is one that, you know, their satire is equally distributed among all things. Because mm-hmm. you so, can't, uh, well, it's like, you know, you can't pick sides in comedy. You know, if you pick right. sides in comedy, you're no longer comedy, you're propaganda. Okay. Yeah. So you, you have to, you have to take the piss out of everyone. And I right. love comics. as do this. Why some of my favorite comics are guys like Lewis Black and George Carlin, you know, because Lewis Black will get up there and make fun of Republicans. And he's done this and, and all the Democrats in the audience laugh. And he goes, oh, don't get too excited, Democrats. I'm coming for you next. You know, <laughs> um, you know and it's, it's like, that's fantastic because everybody needs to have the piss taken out of them because for the most part, everybody deserves it. Um, you know, so I'm fine with right. it. You know, I, hey, if I go to a comedic show and a guy starts making fun of me because I'm fat and wearing a kilt, I'm going to be like, fair. <laughs> and, and you know, one thing that always stuck out to me uh, whenever South Park first started and Rolling Stone did a cover interview with Trey Parker and Matt Stone, there's a quote in that interview. I've got it somewhere because I was a huge South Park fan, but it, I kind of dropped off after the movie, sadly, uh, and I never really came back to it. But I remember that uh, I can't remember, but I can't remember which one of them said it said, we want to we want to see a day years down the road where we look back on this show and hopefully it's still on the air. I remember him saying that was, and we can look at each other and say, you remember whenever there was just a, a, a show about a couple of kids in a trailer park? I think we're there. <laughs> we're, we're definitely there. Yeah. That, I was mean, a, it's just, that was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. And I mean, I, to this day, I still don't understand how a generation that was raised on South Park and Family Guy can be so damn sensitive. No shit. <laughs> like we were, we were raised on, you know, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Mm-hmm. Now, words. I mean, hell, you can't even, you can't even say anything. And like, so you can't even say anything on Twitter these days without the, you know, the woke mob getting after you. I mean, the the woke mob goes after Gina Carano for being supposedly anti-Semitic, but then they turn around and go after Gal Gadot for being pro-Israeli. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> how does that work it's like so you know i i just don't understand how we you know how people our age and younger who grew up on these shows can be so offended by everything and it's just like you know what sometimes a joke's just a joke and you need to laugh man yeah <laughs> dude you know what if, if you can't if you can't take a joke george carlin yeah <laughs> you know Dave Chappelle. I mean, come on. 
That's the point. Oh, I mean, I, 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 I love Chappelle and for modern day comedians as, as somebody who'll take the piss out of everybody. I love Chappelle. Sticks oh, yeah. and stones. And, and of course he named his, his, you know, big comeback sticks and stones. And I, I was crying laughing in sticks and stones. I, I that that was fantastic. He's awesome. I love him to death. Well, um, I, one of the most well written shows best, of the last the, decade. Yeah. Yeah. Still, the best bit that he did for any of that. I mean, I love his story about the four times he met OJ, but really, trying to explain to like white people about when Bill Cosby got accused of rape and you know went to trial and everything about what it really felt, you know, because he was so in, influential to black artists, and he does it in a way of Let's say you like chocolate ice cream, and then you learn chocolate ice cream rape. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like I love, and I love talking about how he's he's like the only black guy in his town in Ohio that he lives in. You know, because he yeah. lives in like small town Ohio. <laughs> like, wait, wait, he he lives here? Who yeah. really seriously that right. guy? Hey, well, the, well, the best part I, was I love that would... spell because he'll always be a chew. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I chew. That's right. Robin Hood, Robin Hood. Men in Tights. But uh, I, I think my favorite joke he talks about, he goes, I went, you know, he goes, I went into a restaurant in the South and I was like, I think I'll have, and they went, the chicken. And I was like, how did they know? And they were like, <laughs> boy, the moment you walked in here, everybody in a restaurant knew you were going to order the fried chicken. And he goes, damn, you know, I was so disappointed because I thought that I liked fried chicken because it was juicy and tender and delicious. I had no idea that I was genetically predisposed to liking chicken. It's kind of ruined it for me. God, he, God he's a genius. That dude is, yeah. he is such a Oh, my a God. Genius. He, I mean, in his comedy show, The Dave Chappelle Show, I mean, you couldn't have come up with a better character to turn its head on racism than, the you blind. know, Clayton would be the black why yeah. white supremacists? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, it kind of. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, I know it's a true story, but basically, that skit got turned into a movie by Spike Lee. I mean, yeah, the yeah. Black Klansman, which, by the yeah. way, um, I am not a huge Spike Lee fan, and I love that movie. That movie's yeah. freaking hilarious. Spike fantastic. Lee did an amazing job. Oh, on that. And and, like I said, yeah. and, and, but I will be honest. I am. Here's my thing against Spike Lee, though. My thing against Spike Lee has nothing to do with his movies. It's because he's a Knicks fan and I'm a Celtics fan, and you don't send Larry Bird black roses. <laughs> and that's fair. That is very, very fair. Very so, fair. But so, yeah, I saw right. I love, South Park's one of my favorite written shows just because they will take the piss out of anybody. They are not afraid of anyone. Well, they we're will go after time, everyone. But- but since Brendan brought up comedies, I want to hit a couple of comedies that have just been fantastic over the last decade. And I have uh, one in particular that I wanted to uh, talk about. I'm probably on my fourth run through the series. You can catch it all on Netflix, but Shit's Creek, created by Eugene and Dan Levy, and his son, uh, Dan. One of the most brilliant, brilliantly written things about you know a family who loses all their money and has to go to the town that they bought as a joke called Shit's Creek. Uh, if you've loved Chris Elliott over the last thirty some odd years, uh, you will love him in this show. And it really, it, it to me, this show is just made by Daniel Levy's character of David, who hates everything and his commentary on stuff. Um, and of course, I love Stevie, just the sergeant. She's kind of like the Jim Halper from The Office of that show, just sardonic and sarcastic. And uh, there's just so many great things to really love about it. And, it, and anytime Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara are playing like man and wife or some kind of couple, which they've done off and on for like 40 years since they did sketch comedy together on some Canadian show uh, in the mid 70s. Um, some or like Canadian 70s. show. Jesus. Yeah. Some uh, SCTV. <laughs>
want to. I'm sorry, Canadians listen to the show. I didn't mean to insult your SNL. What an oversimplification that <laughs> shit was. Shame on you. All right. So, I, I know. My but favorite I'll, line from Eugene Levy and anything he's ever been in will always be We'll just tell your mother we ate it all. <laughs> Well, Bravo, sir. Bravo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, he's hilarious. He's, he's like one of the ultimate like comedic character actors. Like he's his in timing, everything. His, his timing and, is impeccable. And, until two thousand three, yeah. when they did the, the you know a mighty win, which was only character actors. I don't think a lot of people actually knew his name. He was just that guy that was in everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, like many characters name. are. But uh, yeah, he he's hilarious. I I love Eugene Levy. He, dude. Yeah, his writing, like you said, his timing on on lines is just impeccable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said, you could bring together a better cast than uh, what Daniel Eugene did to create that show. And I and I think Daniel Levy has proven that he's just like his father when it comes to timing and you know that metrosexual, uh, bisexual um, kind of hipster that comes from New York uh, that just you know, over drama is the drama queen about everything. Um, but anyway, I highly recommend that I was uh, date last night. We sat down. It was like, let's just start that over. It, it, you know, I you can never go wrong with that series. Kind of like which, by the way, which, by the way, I didn't even realize Dan Levy was Eugene Levy's son until I saw him with glasses on the first time, and then I was like, oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> Oh, his SNL, when he hosted it, he was talking about the history and, like, SNL relics, and there was Eugene Levy and a taste. <laughs> I just thought that was brilliant. But, oh, yeah. So, anyway, that's my uh, big comedy that I that I have loved over the last uh, 10 years. That's, uh, you know, not network TV or anything. All right, Chad, a comedy for you real quick. Oh, God. Well... You're you're gonna hate me for this, but your your aforementioned friends. I thought that was very well consistently written over the course of its run. Well, it's not that we hate friends, it's just that we like coupling more. Yeah. <laughs> and and it's it's so rare that that you really stick the landing on your finale and that you you end about as well as you began. And that was about as satisfying of an ending of a long running sitcom. That in you know, like, like even Cheers left people cold. You're just like, really? That's how you're going to end that thing? It was just such a... Oh, actually, I, just, I, thought Cheers, I thought Cheers was brilliant. I just, I I, mean, it just felt like kind of an awkward landing. It just, you know, like, no, we're closed. You're just like, okay, you know, but... Well, the best, the, 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 the whole thing that was weird about Cheers, too, was the pre-show for the finale, and they had Bob Costas hosting it, doing the yeah. stats, like it was some sports thing. It was like... Yeah. That's yeah. when I first noticed how obnoxious bob costas is as a person <laughs> although i do love him basically playing a character as himself with al michaels as the announcer in basketball by trey parker and matt stone god so oh, yeah um, i mean he's no, not as bad as joe buck or anything but you know oh uh, no oh no i i got gotcha. you um so i mean I, and i get what you're saying about friends i do uh you know w while it ended you know, in 2004, I mean, it, it, you're right. I mean, if, if you have a status, if you've got a show that gives you that great of a satisfying ending, it, it's worth talking about. Unlike other great shows that we've grown up with, where you're just like, like, for example, the Bob Newhart show. No, the entire show was, a, was just a fucking dream from his original show, Newhart, and he wakes up to his, you know, why from that show. Honey, I had this dream. Or my favorite, most ridiculous thing is St. Elsewhere, one of the great oh. doctor shows of the 80s. And the entire thing is made up by the autistic kid in a snow globe. In a snow globe, yeah. I mean, that show literally showed the, the PSTD of a doctor getting raped in prison, played by David Morris. And I mean, you in Denzel Washington was fantastic. It was just like 
talk about such a huge – I mean, if they complain about the Sopranos being a letdown in its season finale, it's kind of open-ended. And, or Dexter, which they have to bring that back now to kind of fix what they did. Now it's just like – but saying elsewhere, like, no, yeah, just in this kid's imagination from a snow globe. <laughs> Whatever. So, all right. Um, we've talked about some of our favorite shows over the past uh, uh, decade, some of the most well-written things that you may not have I, heard of. Let me cut it real quick, Marcus, because unless you're going to do another show, because I didn't say this show because I specifically was leaving it for you and I thought you would. Justified. I agree. And I was going to make one quick mention. Uh, and what I was kind of leading into was there's still more that we have to talk about, uh, mm-hmm. including that. And you're right. that's, that's Marcus and I usually step on each other in shows like this to talk about Justified. So I was going to let Marcus do it. And we went the whole show and he hadn't brought it up. And I was like, oh, we can't let the yeah, show go by without. But, but I also have a, a whole list of shows that I haven't. Yeah, I was kind of shocked you didn't bring up the West Wing, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> the West no, no, no. Well, it's past 10 years. Oh, it, it, that's true. Okay. In 2006. Um, I forget. So, yeah. Uh, now, the newsroom, the other Aaron Sorkin show, which did start in 2011, uh, I, to me, that is one of the most brilliant shows. But uh, now, the one I was going to mention that all nerds can be very, very excited for, it's not a Star Wars show, which that's an, an entirely different podcast. Yeah, I've been chewing uh, my tongue on that one. Stranger Things, and we can't mm-hmm. wait season four yes and by the way you know you've got a good show when you've got to use D D lore to help solve what's going on come on <laughs> and the theme song to the never ending so, story and book of bubba fett just wrapped filming uh oh, I, wanted to say, I wanted to say something about that uh, there's a movie coming out uh operation rainfall and we'll be interviewing the director this week uh and doing a quick review and when i first got the announcement um it was. Bless you. I tried to mute myself. Sorry, it didn't work. No. <laughs> oh. So when I saw like casting crew, I looked at the cast like tomorrow Morrison. Please make that so. And then I I emailed the 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 the, the publicist I'm like, is that actually going to happen? And all I got was, well, um, he's not available because he's still he's filming something for Disney. I'm like, damn it. Yeah, yeah. Wonder what that right. Did you take a quick break? Well, and the great thing is, so, so you know that the, the stagecraft and the volume um, that they used to film the Mandalorian. Yes, they they built three more of them. So there's one in Australia. Good. They there's one in Australia. They filmed Loki on that, um, and there's one. There's a second one in L.A. and there's one in uh, London. So they're currently filming Andor in London. They're going to be filming Obi-Wan and Mando season three uh, concurrently on the two in L.A. And then uh, after one of those is done, they'll do Ahsoka. But yeah, so they're so and then what they're doing, whatever's next for Marvel and the one in Australia, I guess the Australia has kind of been designated as the Marvel one. So I guess Hawkeye probably. Was Hawkeye, yeah. I think so. all, all I'm saying is I was very disappointed to hear that, that you know, he wasn't available because he's filming something. And I'm sure. just thinking. He could take a break while we're in the Boba Fett armor and do a quick yeah. interview with it. Because he's just a simple guy trying to make his way in the universe, right? That's right. <laughs> right. Come on. Make that happen. But we get it. So, all right. We're going to wrap this up. Thank you, you know, and if Ming Na Wen wants to photo bomb him, we're good with that. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, we, we will be off Memorial Day weekend next week, and then we'll be back in June uh, with uh, some other podcasts. We're changing up our schedule. Uh, and here's what we're going to be talking about um, in talking about uh, dating apps and stuff like that. Uh, there's a dating app called Hinge where you basically pose questions and stuff like that. And, and I thought this was kind of funny. One came across about um, if you think that DC is better than Marvel, you should not date me. And I was like, I've got to find, and I, I had to get on there and because someone was telling me about it and I had to track this person down. Uh, to see what that was just to talk to her and i'm like what is your criteria for this yeah because are we talking cinematic universes are we talking cartoons are we talking comics 
because yeah. I mean, these are very different things. Like I, I, you know, if we're talking cinematic universes, okay. Marvel has definitely got the edge. If we're talking animated, I'm going to give the edge to DC. And if you're talking comics, it's kind of a 50, yes. 50. So, right. And that's, and that's our point is there's so much criteria that goes into determining which one is better. So it's, it's kind of a blanket statement just to say that, you know, Marvel is better than DC. Okay. Yeah, and and on TV, I mean, you, you could kind of go 50-50 either because, you know, you the, you got the Arrowverse, but there's some good things and bad things in that. You've got Titans and you've got Doom Patrol, but then they've got, you know, the Netflix with Marvel, with um, Daredevil and Punisher. I mean, there's so many, eh, like that, yeah, it's too yeah. much, too much. So we, I, I feel like here at that nerd show, we, we have to explore that and give you the criteria to determine which is better, if there is anything better. So we'll be talking about that in June when we come to that. So looking forward to that. All right, everybody. We're out of here for this week. Have a great Memorial Day weekend. Stay nerdy. Uh, there's more episodes of The Bad Batch. Uh, and if you haven't quite gotten into it yet, uh, only one episode left. Uh, if you're a Mighty Ducks fan, you should be watching Mighty Ducks uh, Game Changers, the little Mighty Ducks uh, series they have on Disney Plus with Emilio Estevez. And Maybe Bad Batch is. Bad Batch is going all the way into August, which means we get Bad Batch and Loki uh, on the same week, starting in June. But anyway, you're a Mighty Ducks fan, like the movies, check out this series. It's a lot of fun. Um, And as Brendan said, there's a lot to look forward to with Disney Plus, uh, which we'll be talking about throughout the summer. Speaking of which, who's looking forward to the first Owen Wilson? Wow. At something that Loki does. (laughs) <laughs> it's gonna happen it's gonna happen all right everybody stay nerdy we're out of here say goodbye guys take care Bye. guys